Good evening, America. You're about to listen to me, Sergeant Dave, with Remember the Fallen podcast. After the survival instincts of an 8 ton rollover accident in the Parwan province of Afghanistan in 2004, I emerged and returned to the States with an even more enduring tale of perseverance as I navigate the troubled waters of the VA system. I gain a new perspective and a renaissance that I will share with you with a fever of enthusiasm to all patriots across the windswept fields of America. All right, you're about to listen to me. Remember the following show with me, Sergeant Dave. We're well, going to be listening to jarheads, squids, Air Force. We call them penguins because 98% of them don't fly jets. Army, ground pounders like myself, and an occasional coastie. Ah, Maybe not, but most of all, I will be advocating to the Patriots that get a lump in their throat when they hear the national anthem being played at a ball game. You see, one of us can be run off, two of us can be disregarded, but a show's audience, together, we are a movement. All right, we're here at beautiful Seminole County, USA, on the Winter Springs Oviedo Line. And we're in the Never Forgotten Memorial YouTube studio, and I'm here live with Brian McLaughlin, and he is the commander for the VFW in Chile Oto. We call it the East Seminole County, post 10139. And I just wanted to say thank you for coming out, Brian, on this beautiful evening, watching the sunset here at the studio. And it's just great seeing you again, Brian. Ah, So how's things going with getting ready for Christmas? Things going well, Dave. Thank you very much. Awesome. Okay, Brian, I'd like to start off with the Library of Congress interview questions. All right, so we're going to start off with, with simple, and we're going to start off with what branch of service did you serve in, and how long of a term? I was in the Coast Guard. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> I thought somebody had to do it with you. But no, I was I was in the Army. Uh, I joined in 1988. So. Another ground pounder, folks, right? So, yeah, uh, I had to mess with you a little bit. Somebody <laughs> yeah. has to. That's a good one, man. You caught, you caught me off guard. guard here, Dave's face just dropped. <laughs> he caught me off guard with that one. And you said, uh, and you went as high up as a colonel, right? Lieutenant colonel. Lieutenant colonel, LTC, but still, I'm a, I, was, I'm, I take my hat off. I salute you, man. That's a lot of work. I mean, you had to go through, you know, uh, being a butter bar, right? Then you went up to all that. So um, tell me a little bit more about um, or why you joined. What was the main, you know, uh, premise that you joined the military? Um, well, actually, growing up in the Northeast, uh, I had uh, a family that I was very close with uh, that lived down the street. And we basically, this family's dad was in the National Guard, and we'd see him come home every single night. And... He kind of inspired us. Uh, I'm the only one that actually joined the military, uh, but we all um, honored this guy and all looked up to him because when he walked through that door, I mean, just not even wearing the uniform, he just commanded respect, and I just loved that and wanted to be part of something that just commanded that much respect. A weekend warrior, awesome. Yeah. So, um, so do you remember? So you, so you enlisted. Do you remember that day? You just went in there. You went into the recruiter. How did you? get recruited was there uh, a certain building you went to or you went from school right directly from school so how'd you uh get, meet that meet up with the recruiter uh that was a long time ago 30 something years yeah um i think i just drove down to the recruiting office and i uh, said hey I, i'm interested what do you guys have and uh talked to him for a little bit and he he signed me up and uh i was 17 at the time when i signed up and i Graduated in June, and I left November 2nd, 1988, to uh, go to basic training. Well, I know when I joined, there was a armory right across the street where I played baseball for eight years, watching these guys go in, watching ceremonies, and it just kind of drew me in. And then one time after school one day, uh, I was out of school, and then uh, I was just, just playing softball, and I was like, maybe I need something different, man. How am I gonna, I don't want I don't want to stay in Boston forever, and I knew that was gonna be my ticket out of the cold weather and it worked man it worked it was awesome right so um let's go ahead and ask you uh so we were living at the time you said you were living i was living in new hampshire and uh my dad my friend's dad was in the new hampshire national guard and just like you said we actually played baseball right behind his armory 
And I can remember going in there as an eight-year-old, 10-year-old, and climbing on the five tons, the deuce yeah. and a halves, uh, just playing with the equipment as he's in his little meetings and yeah. stuff. And uh, there's five or six of us running around the armory floor. It was great. Something similar to what I did, yeah. So um, do you recall the first days in service? The first days. Um, I can remember uh, arriving at basic training, uh, being in the holding uh, camp, waiting to, thinking that this was hard, and then all of a sudden they put us on buses in El Paso and uh, took us up to the actual basic training site and getting off that bus and them yelling at you and just scrambling to try to uh, get to where you're going and not mess up. Um, yeah, it was it was interesting, yeah. different. There's always one colleague that falls on his duffel bag. Did you get one of them come running so fast he fell and fell right on his duffel bag? Because you a double duffel bag, okay? Can you imagine? You got a duffel bag in the front, then you have a duffel bag in the back. So if you yeah. fell, you weren't going to get hurt. <laughs> it was, so I remember one guy, it's hilarious, coming off the bus. And I remember just, the first uh, TA-50 um, right there as soon as we got off the bus, making sure they had all your TA-50. And laying it out and making sure that you didn't lose anything between uh, reception and going to the basic training. Yep, on the on the drill floor, right? Just lay it all oh, out. We were in Paso, it was outside. Outside, was it outside? Okay. And um, so uh, boot camp, training experiences, anything different that stands out at boot camp? Um, I know I was lucky. I was really in good shape. So I actually got in trouble a lot with my drill instructor so he'd help me get in more shape and I was joking and kind of stuff so I wouldn't like get in real bad trouble but he'd put me down and do leg lifts and stuff like that so I enjoyed doing stuff uh, extra kind of uh, exercise so I could eventually max my P test so I was, I was pretty cool my drill sergeant was Sergeant Thomas was there a certain instructor that, that stood out for you? Uh, only one um, when I went through basic uh, I don't remember a lot of the stuff I do remember I actually True story, I fell asleep in the front leaning rest because <laughs> halfway through basic training, I got mono. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I got run down so hard that uh, I got mono. I had to be put in the hospital for uh, two, three days. So when I came out of the hospital and they're going through the uh, obstacle course, yeah. I couldn't do that with them. So I had to stay with one of the drill sergeants, and uh, I got to know him a little bit. But then about 10 years later, I'm a senior lieutenant, and he's a sergeant. he was a buck sergeant at the time. Now he's a sergeant first class. And I saw him in the PX. I'm like, hey, Sergeant, remember me? And he had thousands of soldiers go through right. at the time. He says, nope. I'm like, well, I remember you because you were my drill sergeant. <laughs> yeah, right. He's like, roger that, sir. Yeah. And did you serve in any um, war capacity? Any any kind of service in the war? What what, what war? What, what, uh, Actually, what I you qualified for the uh, VFW uh, due to three different events. Um, the first place I went was Bosnia. Uh, I went over there as an individual augmentee to 1st Armored Division and then 1st Infantry Division. Uh, second one is I went to Korea, spent a year in Korea uh, theater uh, with one of the uh, artillery battalions over there. And then uh, much later, I went to Iraq and with three corps and served in Iraq. Iraq. Does the name David Balavia, Staff Sergeant David Balavia, ring a bell, the Medal of Honor recipient, just got it recently. Did that ring a bell to you, that name? Uh, no, I don't know. You have to give me a time frame if I was over there and which unit he was in. Yeah, okay, so you got to hear that. Beautiful, uh, the best uh, speech I ever heard. I mean, I, out of a, I hear a lot, and I'll tell you what. Remember that name, Staff Sergeant David Bellavia. Google his name, okay? So um, so you did, did you see combat? Did you actually see combat? Did you were you a part of it? Did you wear a patch or, or anything like that? Uh the closest I got to combat is them shelling our compound. Uh, I was not a uh, kick. I was not out there kicking down doors. I was part of the staff both times uh, in Bosnia. I was part of, like I said, First Armored Division uh, Division staff, uh, working the floor there, the chalk floor. And then when I was in uh, Iraq, I was part of Three Corps staff. I was uh, Chief of Ministry of Interior. I was in charge of all of the police forces in Iraq, and uh, then. Um, giving reports up to the senior officials, uh, to the people I talked to, or three of them, uh, General Casey, General Petraeus, uh, General Odierno, um, General Dempsey. I've had to brief all of them. Wow. So that was like more logistics. So you were the logistics side of it? No. Uh, uh, the training of the uh, police forces, the Sherpas. Uh, they have to be trained um, to be able to do policing. Uh, think of this. 
they when we got there they had maybe twenty thousand uh, trained police uh, officers. By the time I left it in fifteen months, they were up to two hundred twenty thousand uh, police officers going out there patrolling uh, different areas because wow. they just did not do that. Right. Wow, that's a lot. You're talking. We had to serious. Uh, Train them, arm them, uh, clothe them, and get them ready to go out there and uh, provide safety for the local populace. So when it was when it, your um, battalion was shelled, were there any casualties during that time? Uh, one uh, in one rocket attack that was outside the Alpha Palace, and as we were leaving, uh, we got rocket attacks. And this one female, I don't know her name. All I know is that she had the worst luck. A uh, couple rockets rockets came in. One hit her hooch and destroyed it. Luckily, she wasn't in there. Unfortunately, she was in the shower, which also got hit, oh. and she died in the shower. She, there was no place for her to run. They, some, they had her number. Oh, that's so sad. You're right, yeah. So um, what rank? You said you went all up to LTC. Um, were you awarded any medals or any citations during these three times in theater? Uh the highest citation I got uh, in Iraq was a Bronze Star. Uh, nothing valor, valorious. Um, right. I just got a Bronze Star for uh, being there and doing a, a job on the core staff. Yeah, that's great. Bronze Star is awesome. I saw that on you. I think I might have saw that on your on your catalog. I don't know. Was that was that Not was that just your rank? That was my major rank. <laughs> that was your major rank. Okay, okay. So. Um, so with, with all that being full-time, because you were active, obviously, right? Yes. So how did you keep in touch with your family when you were going through all those three different theaters? When I was in uh, Bosnia, that was back in the 90s, I used phone cards. Uh, and standing in line for the phones and the yeah. phone tents uh, to call back to my parents and talk to them like once a week, uh, hoping that they were home because you couldn't send emails or anything like that. Uh, even though I had email at the time, my parents didn't. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, and then when I was in Iraq, we had emails that I could uh, send back and forth with my wife. Uh, and also, uh, they had a switch set up from Iraq to 3 core at Fort Hood. And if you dial a certain number, they would actually give you a local number and it'd be like talking from your work at Fort Hood to my house. So it was cheap, easy, fast, and I could right. call my wife. So were you a dad at any of those theaters? What, uh, what time were you a dad? Before I went to Iraq, uh, I had a three- and four-year-old daughter. Uh, so, yeah. That's been tough, right? I mean... Oh, yeah. And, and especially your wife, the support that you need when, when you do that. That's great support system. Actually, going to Iraq was the easy part because all I had to do was take care of myself. The hard part was before I went to Iraq, I was part of an ACRC unit training all the National Guard and uh, reserve units going overseas to help to backfill active duty. Um, I was working 20 hours a day, sometimes seven days a week, uh, being deployed down to Fort Dix. Uh, I was at Fort Drum. My wife has, actually she had uh, two of our children when, when I was there, and that was the hardest part. I missed them walking, I missed them talking because I was training soldiers to go overseas. That was harder than being yeah, deployed. Yeah, that is tough, that is. But well, we, we appreciate your sacrifice for your family for doing it for our country. Definitely appreciate that. And how, what was the food like? Do you have good food over there? I'll eat anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm KBR. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they we had the KBR. They were just that was the time when, you know, food was real important. They say, you know, uh I think uh, Napoleon said it best, you know, you feed a soldier, I mean that's how you win wars, right? Oh you got belly over there too, because you know, they serve the same thing every single week. Uh, Monday through Friday. Fridays, you have uh, lobster and steak sometime, most of the time. Um, I just got creative on spaghetti night. I say, I don't want the spaghetti. I get a couple meatballs, go over to the sandwich uh, area and get a, uh, a roll, and I make myself a meatball sandwich. And people are like, where'd you get that? Yeah. <laughs> or uh, on, the sh on the salad bar, they have a little shrimp, and uh, they always have cocktail sauce. So I'd have shrimp cocktail every once in a while. So cool. you have to get creative when you're over there. Yeah. So do you feel pressure or any, any stress with your job, well, with your, your military occupational your status? of How did you feel? Was, it, was there pressure on you? Was there stress involved? Did you have to get so many, a quota of trained individuals? No, not really a quota. Really? The, the, the most stress was, like I said, I was a major over there, and briefing senior, senior officials 
Um, so that's always stressful when you have to go up and uh, talk to a three-star general, or you're in a room, you're in a room with 15 stars, um, and it's not even sometimes Americans. I was once in a room with 122 stars, and most of them were Iraqis. So uh, that could be stressful. Yeah, I could see that. So do you ever go on leave? Did they give you a chance to go on leave at any of these deployments that you had? Oh yeah, every single one of them. Uh, in uh, Iraq, I came home, saw my three and four year old daughter. It, that was outstanding. Um, I don't remember much from that, just because it was a whirlwind and trying to uh, say hi and uh, fit back in with the family. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Korea, I actually flew home on my mid tour and got married to my wife. Uh, that was 21 years ago, almost 21 years ago now. Uh, so I got married on my mid tour. Oh, right. And then, uh, in Bosnia, uh, I actually just took an R and R. It was over Thanksgiving, and uh, they brought me up to Budapest, Hungary, and I got to see a little bit of. Uh, the old Soviet Republic on the other side of the wall. Wow! See, rank has its privilege. No, that's for all of them. <laughs> okay. I was I was actually out with enlisted guys. Okay, you were all right. <laughs> okay, so um, is any uh, soldier like stand out that you um, maybe you still keep in touch with? You know, battle buddy. Was there someone that was always like kind of like just kept you in the game? Like, oh yeah, we couldn't be more opposite, but we are still talking all the time. Uh, I got one friend, Steve Parker. Um, he, we went through officer basic course together back in '94. Uh, stayed in touch. Uh, met again. Going, I think we, he was the class ahead of me for the officer advanced course. And then we went to Iraq. He was my roommate. Oh wow! What a time! That's awesome, man. Parker, I have to remember Parker. Okay, so do you recall? Did you keep a, um, a personal diary or anything? Uh, closest thing I have is uh, later on I became a simulation officer, so I know computers, and I was able to um, I saved all of my emails, uh, all my PST files, uh, all my unclassified okay. PST. I couldn't, I can't save the secure ones. Right. Uh, but all my unclassified um, emails, I still have them on a zip drive. I have mine. My sister just told me I was up on vacation. She has all my emails that are unclassified. And I meant to, to go look at them, but I forgot to. But we'll catch that next year. Definitely there. So do you recall the day your service ended? The day it ended? The day it actually ended was anticlimactic. Um, because I was in Iraq just a couple of years before, and I kept um, the most amount of leave I could, uh, my discharge date was uh, September 30th, 2015. But I had been on leave since... Uh, May. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We you um, leave at home? I, I actually um, out-processed from the Pentagon, and when I would retired, my, I asked my wife, where do you want to go? You've been following me our, my whole career. Where do you want to live? And she says, let's live where other people vacation. So we moved down to Orlando. And uh, I was actually in Orlando looking for a job uh, in the area um, when, when, I, when, I, when I became official. Oh, okay. He's a Floridian. All right. So just like myself, I, I moved from Boston. You moved from New Hampshire, right? Now, you said, now, how far were you from Kingston? Is that What part of New Hampshire are you from? Uh, I'm from the seacoast, uh, right by Portsmouth. Oh, okay. Portsmouth, yeah. And Newburyport, kind of Newburyport, up, yep. right up the line there. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. So, okay. So uh, what did you do on the days and weeks afterward? After you retired, you said you got a job. Did you get the job right away? Was it kind of you know kind of stressful trying to look for that job? How did that work out? Oh, it was very stressful. Stressful uh, looking for a job afterwards, uh, to the point where uh, a buddy of mine in Leavenworth gave me a call and said, "Hey, I got a job out here." I actually left Orlando and moved to Leavenworth, Kansas, as a geographical bachelor for a year. Uh, left my wife and kids here again. Uh, so that was another deployment for me. Oh. And I lived in uh, Kansas uh, working in Tradoc G2 uh, for about a year. And then uh, the contract I was working on got downsized. I was like, oh, darn, i got to move back to Orlando with my family. <laughs> right. And then I came down here, and I, I picked up a job fairly soon after. Oh, that is, that's awesome that you picked up a job right away. It is difficult. That transition's tough, folks. So if you know any veterans out there, try to help them get a job. That's one of the toughest things, that transition portion of it. 
So did you work? You see, you went to work. You didn't have to go back to school for anything. Did you have to go back to school for anything? No, I already have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. So, um, and I, I was artillery, uh, but about the tenth or eleventh year, I kind of changed my uh, job description. I moved to simulation operations. Uh, so I actually worked um, as a simulation officer. And down here in Orlando, there's the PEO STRI, which is the Pro Program Executive Office for Simulations Training. Uh, readiness and integration, or close enough, something like that. Good enough to cover yeah. work. Uh, but I got a job there in Orlando. And it's, Orlando's becoming a big hub in simulation, right? By the, especially by the airport, right? Uh, no, it, it's actually on Cape Canal? Research and Science Drive right by UCF. Oh, right. Okay. UCF is a huge um, simulations training uh, school. It uh, has a feeder system right out of Haggerty High, so if you have people in the area uh, going to Haggerty, they can uh, learn simulations and then get jobs with the government or with some of the bigger uh, contracting um, agencies such as Lockheed, Raytheon, and so on and so forth. So after that, did you join any veterans organizations? Uh, currently, the only one I'm uh, involved with is the VFW. Uh, however, I am, um, I got a, on my desk, um, an application to the Military Officers Association of America, MOAA. And so what kinds of activities does your post do for uh, veterans? I mean, what kind of, can you help us out, tell the audience, what do you guys do? Well, some of the uh, things we do is we uh, honor and help veterans um, on the most basic um, post-level thing I think that we do is we allow uh, veterans to come in and feel at home. Um, one of the things that you always hear or you hear veterans say about each other is uh, you just won't understand. Well, you know what? We would. We've been there. Uh, so it gives them a chance to um, unload what they've been carrying around that baggage, you know, with other people that's been there and seen that. So it helps with the PTSD a little bit, I yeah. think. It gives them a chance. And it has been proven, you know, veterans helping veterans. You have a higher rating, higher success rate of, of you know, accomplishing, um, hopefully turning the soldier around, pointing him in the right direction. And so that's that's been definitely proven. And so... Um, is well, to also to go along with that, it's also the first stop if you don't know where to go to, for our service officers to help you. If you have injuries and need help uh, with the VA, it's a first stop. Go to your uh, VFW. We have members that are trained. They can't uh, do a lot of the stuff um, such as submit your paperwork, but they can give you, hand you over to professionals that will help fill out the paperwork correctly and submit it to the VA to get your uh, compensation, to get help with your medical issues, uh, to help you just take the next step in life if you've been injured or have service-connected disability, uh, so on and so forth. And I noticed that you um, you do things for uh, helping um, veterans cope, basically with their PTSD, like uh, fishing. You had an event at your post, yeah. which is very successful. You had more than 80 people there. Uh, uh, I, I would love to take credit for that, uh, and I know that you were there, I was there, uh, but we, I, one of my members owns a non-profit organization, uh, Joe Lamille, or Lamalley. Uh, yeah, Joe Lamalley, yeah. Uh, he actually is the runner of that 5013C, and he should he gets all the credit. I, he, all he does is use my post. I support him with whatever he needs, but he is the impetus for that, and uh, it's an outstanding thing. Uh, he collects... Um, Donations. He collects uh, fishing gear and refurbishes it. If you have fishing gear that you want to um, donate to us, I will get it to Joe if you drop it off by the post. And he then uh, gives it out to veterans. The last year, he had 32 veterans come by that he uh, gave approximately $100, $150 worth of fishing gear out to. Uh, this year, he gave about $125, $130, but to 80 veterans uh, that showed up. Uh, and it was a great event for those guys. They, they had a blast. And they came from all over. They did. Now, um, a lot of them came um, from by the Tallahassee area, they were telling me. Uh, yeah, it's just some great veterans just helping out. Uh, veterans helping veterans go fishing. That's basically the concept with there. And, and he's doing a great job. He's on his fifth year now. And he's and he's getting hooked up with uh, Hooked on Heroes. Yep. So they're going to tie in together. I'll be doing a live show with Joe Lamalley here very shortly, too. So I just want to cover some of the things that I received with the VFW. I just got something from the desk of Kevin C. Jones, who's the Adjutant General of the VFW. 
So he's expressing to me there's a lot of hard work behind every victory the VFW secures for veterans. Work that is only possible because of what we do. Okay, So with our help, we were able to advocate for the passage of the Blue Water Navy Vietnam Veterans Act in 2019. Now we are advocating for its full and swift implementation. For a century, the VFW has had an office right in Washington, D.C., and worked on Capitol Hill. Did you, did you hear that? A century. A hundred years they've been at this. That's amazing, you know. I don't think people realize that how much the VFW gets involved with uh, the whole capacity of veterans. And uh, so they, they ensure you get your, your hard-earned benefits. It's so important that these uh, veterans know that. And we've, they've won many battles over the years, but our work is not done. It's never done. There's always work. So and in 2019... We, they always want to, you know, come and prepare for more battles ahead. So they want to make a, a commitment, redouble your commitment to making your voice heard, which we are doing now. And so they want to thank us for our, the dedication that we do, me and Brian do, to help ensure we can stay in the front lines to fight for you, to fight for justice, to fight for veterans. And that's right from the Adjutant General at uh, 406 West 34th Street in Kansas City, Missouri, 64111. So if you want to write to Kevin C. Jones, the Adjutant General, once again, his address is 406 West 34th Street, Kansas City, Missouri, 6411. All right, Brian, I'm going to put you on the spot. Which veteran patriotic holiday do you, your post, you feel that they really get involved in it, that they do the best work? So which one patriotic holiday do you think the post does their best on? reaching out to the community, showing that what we do for our veterans, because as you know, uh, the logo for a VFW is no one does more for veterans. Well, I'd have to say that's Valentine's Day. No. <laughs> <laughs> Valentine's Day. All right, another good one. Cha-cha. Okay. No, uh, actually, uh, Veterans Day and Memorial Day are uh, probably the two biggest that uh, people look towards the veterans. Uh, but for a VFW post, uh, we honor our dead on Memorial Day, but Veterans Day is the day we honor the ones that are still alive and are around. Um, it, although for the veterans at my post, this is actually the day that we think of giving back to our community uh, because all year long these these people support us. They uh, always stop in and saying hi, thank you, Chuliota, Oviedo, uh, East Seminole County. They are so homegrown, so great. Uh, Geneva uh, is part of that too. They're just great people and they support us all year round. So on uh, Veterans Day, my post gives back to them from the veterans and we do a fireworks uh, celebra- or a Veterans Day celebration uh, culminating with fireworks. And we uh, plan all year round uh, for the fireworks and we, um, so we set off the fireworks. And Dave, this was your first year there. What did you think of it? Because I'd like some feedback. Yeah, I, I was honored to be a co-host, right? You yeah. made um, us and Rock and Bruce. Yep. We brought them in. Um, I got a chance to set up early, which I like that. You know, I wasn't. I didn't feel rushed. There's a lot of events I go to. I got to get there. I got to do all this running around. But because I spent most of the day with you, uh, I was basically your A driver, kind of. And uh, we, we did that event at, at the Riverside Fitness. Yep. We did that two-mile walk. Yep. That was about a mile, right? But, no, it was but, actually 2.19 2. 2. 2. miles. 2.1 mile walk. We did it with the American flags, and uh, we had a lot of fun with that. And then we did uh, recruited. We did recruitment. Yes, uh, great day in the country. Great day. Uh, ladies Auxiliary uh, puts on. That was an incredible event. It was over 1,000 vendors. That was amazing, the money that the people, the opportunity you had to reach out to the community and I hope we got some uh, membership that day. I hope we did that. Let's go back to the fireworks. Wow, what a turnout. We're talking patriotism in this community. It thrives. That's why I love about East Seminole County Post 10139. And what Facebook page is that again? What? Uh, it's actually uh, Post 10139. 10139. Pretty simple, yeah, right? Pretty simple to find. Keep it simple, right? Kiss. The kiss method's here. Same yeah. thing with our email. Post 10139 at Gmail. If you okay. ever want uh, questions for the post. Uh, just post 10139 at Gmail and we'll get it. All right, great. You hear that, right? Okay, so, yeah, what I liked about that was uh, just, uh, the, it wasn't like, <clears throat> it was a great overflow. I liked the overflow. It wasn't like 
guiding people around. Like you had to stay over here. You could tell you had a lot of freedom. That's what, that's what I enjoyed. That people were walking everywhere. You could say hello to them. So I created a little uh, buzz in the crowd, and I created uh, what soldiers carry in battle. So I had about 50 pounds in my ruck. And I had ages from 7 to 76, carrying the load, showing off in front of the, uh, the group of, of over 1,000 people and getting them involved and, and getting them clapping. After they finished, I said, hey, give them a hand. And, and everyone went nuts. So I had them go across the street, uh, touch the tree, and come back. And it was just a, a great sight to see. And who knows, you, you know, some of these young kids, they might join the service that little connection they had with their parents there and they were so proud and I handed them out um, bandanas and I remember the next day we had breakfast there and the youngest kid he showed up with his bandana around his neck the boy scout okay. and I was so impressed and you could tell he was so proud that he was involved in that the next day he was still wearing his bandana yeah, yeah. it was a great day and they, they had a great time and we had um, a great I came to the post about three years ago after I retired, and the post is set up so beautifully. We got our own lake, and uh, the, we have a barge push off from there that the uh, fireworks go off the barge and over the lake, so you get both in the sky and you can see it on the water. Uh, we had uh, a musician, Brian Buchanan, uh, playing live music, playing patriotic music as the fireworks are going off. It sounded great, and then we had three great vendors with uh, Chick-fil-A, who uh, supports veterans big time, uh, Backstreet Pizza out of uh, Oviedo, and of course, Rock and Brews. And, and then, uh, yeah, and then we also had uh, one of our sponsors that didn't have a uh, booth there, but they had uh, Riverside Fitness. Uh, they were one of our biggest sponsors. And um, what are you doing? <laughs> I want you to name those sponsors. It just kind of helped that, out. Those, those aren't my sponsors. Oh, they, those Riverside Fitness Oh, those sponsors. Riverside Fitness sponsors. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Riverside Fitness, uh, they sponsor, they have sponsors that sponsor them that help us uh, also. Uh, so we just, uh, and then Dan Newland also, uh, attorney in uh, Orlando, he helps support us. Uh, so if uh, anybody out there is listening and they want to help sponsor for next year's um, fireworks, we're always looking for help. Um, one of the things that we're looking for is if we can pay for the fireworks, anything extra, uh, we're looking to help veterans uh, in the community and uh Get that help the veterans help themselves. Uh, we don't do handouts; we do hand ups. Okay. So, how do you how did your service and experience affect your life? The what you're doing now with the community? How does that affect uh, with your family? How does that affect your experiences? You know, what you're doing now as as the commander of you have a big position over there. I mean, not many people want to step up and take that responsibility, right? I'm not sure if I wanted to. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, uh, no, just my experience of being uh, on staff and planning uh, makes it a little bit easier. Being a type A personality, uh, you know, taking charge and making make, making things move out uh, always helped. And then having, of course, a uh, little bit of computer experience, yeah. uh, doing the social media, uh, getting the word out, and then just pressing the flesh, going out there and meeting people. I mean, Dave, you were the master at that. You're always out there talking to people. Uh, so... Just doing stuff like that actually helps a whole lot. Yeah, I, I might might take on that position of surgeon. Is that what you, 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 the uh, position at the post? Yeah, but I'm uh, for the uh, upcoming year. I'm actually thinking of uh, membership uh, chairman, uh, maybe house committee chairman. Uh, there's a couple. A surgeon's one of them. Uh, maybe service officer. Service officer is the one that you that actually touches feels and gets those guys from the street into the hands of a certified service officer uh, from the state that can actually help them. you are the go-between uh, from the man on the street with questions mm -hmm. answering uh, basic questions to the guy that's actually going to put them in the VA system so so how would I train for that tell me uh, how that works actually the state uh, does a yearly um, class on that it's about six to seven hours long uh, they go over all kinds of uh, things and they answer questions throughout the whole, the whole thing. I've actually been through it. It's very informative. Uh, but with all the other duties I have, I, yeah. I, I can't do it. I'm looking for somebody that can be dedicated to that. And also out in the street, which, Dave, I know you're out in the street talking to veterans all the time, uh, both in your regular job and in your job with uh, uh, Never Forgotten Memorials. Well, let's talk about neverforgottenmemorials.org. 
Yeah, so I have a um, you know, a five hundred one C three, and you know, every every Veterans Day, I I always do something. But you know, Memorial Day is basically it's basically my Olympics on Memorial Day. So we want to do something special this year. I told you I had uh, over three hundred wreaths from Afghanistan. You said we want to do something special with those wreaths. So looking forward to Memorial Day with the VFW Post uh, 10139, which will be my first year of Memorial Day with them. So I'm going to bring a lot to that to that uh, event, to that venue. Uh, all my my flags I have, 13 flags that really stand out. We're going to do that and I'll bring my, my five POW table and we'll do the ceremony. I'd like to do that as well. So we have an extra few minutes. So yeah, I would like to kind of like co-host that event with you, if that's okay. So is there anything you would like to add that we have not covered this in this interview, Brian? Is there anything we, that you want to add? Actually, the only thing I have to add is um, we're always looking for veterans out there that that need to be part of the VFW. It, it, or not even part of the VFW, American Legions, uh, DAV, a veterans organization, because camaraderie is always uh, number one. I mean, that's what we all serve for, is the camaraderie with your brothers left and right. That's what you fought for. So, if you're a veteran out there and you listen to this, please, just walk into a VFW post. Say, hey, hi, I'm a veteran. How do I join? Or, uh, what do you guys do? Just come in and say hi. Right. Uh, we're there. We're, we want to listen. We want to help. We want to We want to get to know you. Right. I mean, it's. I love having new people come in because it's another uh, buddy that I have that I didn't know I had before. Right. So it's like relationship building is definitely an antidepressant out there. So if you're one of those soldiers that's not getting out and about, just go ahead. Go into these veteran service organizations and just tell them a little bit about yourself. And you'll you'll see they'll, they'll greet you with open arms and you'll get that camaraderie. And, and find that, that person that has almost this, you know, very similar to what you like, your you know what your attributes are, and all it takes is that one relationship that really can take you out of a, a doom and gloom situation you might be in. So just want to make sure you you build a relationship because that's the best antidepressant they say out there is to get out there and just get out there and meet and get in the community, volunteer wherever. I mean, if it has to be with pets, any type of volunteering with the adult, uh, with the, a lot going on, with uh, just driving veterans to their appointments, you know, be their caretaker, just go with them on with the VA appointment, take notes for them, anything like that, to get out, just don't stay home and, and play call on duty warfare games, you know, get out there into the community. And so, uh, Brian, I just want to thank you for coming by the and Never Forgotten Memorial YouTube studio and sharing your experiences with the military. And I, I really do appreciate all your hard work you do as commander of East Seminole County Post 10139. Thanks, Dave.